good for you. Come on. We'll think of another place. Come with me. Let's have a smoke break. Nah, not just a normal break. Let's smoke break. Smoke break. Smoke break. seconds and coming. There were plenty of years where there were guys who would dread being drafted by the Buffalo Bills. Not anymore. Astronauts report it feels good. Team on at 25 seconds. Brandon Bean realizes they're in a window of two to three years max to get this done while the iron's still hot. And getting Von Miller into that situation was big for the Bills. Ten, nine. Oh, ho, ho, baby. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. on the Buffalo Fanatics YouTube channel on a Monday night. And that, of course, can only mean one thing. It is the Smoke Break, powered by BetUS, where the game begins. Receive a 125% sign-up bonus in the link in the description below. A lot to talk about tonight, folks, as we are fresh off of championship weekend. And the stage is set. For Las Vegas two weeks from yesterday as the San Francisco 49ers, the NFC team who has appeared in four of the last five NFC conference title games, take on Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs who have appeared in six straight title games and are now heading to their fourth Super Bowl in five years with Patrick Mahomes looking to claim his third Super Bowl title in just six seasons of starting. It was the worst possible outcome we could have imagined yesterday, but ultimately the outcome we got. It was the two teams that in the beginning of the year, if you said I could see the Chiefs taking on the Niners in the Super Bowl, nobody would have called you crazy. In fact, they would have said, hmm, I could easily see that happening. And that is, of course, exactly what happens. It will be the uh, the Bills. <laughs> I wish. It will be the Chiefs. It will be the San Francisco 49ers in the Super Bowl in Las Vegas two weeks from yesterday. We will dive into that game throughout the next couple of weeks. We'll talk, of course, about what we might expect to see in that game. We'll talk about, you know, predictions and, and whatever else. we got plenty of time to do that. Um, but that will be what the next two weeks look like and yesterday was hoping for a better championship weekend and by better I was hoping for at least one team that I had pseudo rooting interest in at this point to make it neither did we were all pulling I'm I'm sure for Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens just so it was anybody but the Kansas City Chiefs didn't go that way and then if you were like me, you were pulling for the Detroit Lions simply because you know that that fan base is as tortured as ours, perhaps maybe even a little bit more, seeing that they never even had the privilege of losing, losing four straight Super Bowls because they have never been to a Super Bowl. And a heartbreaking loss doesn't come close to describing what the Detroit Lions suffered yesterday in San Francisco. I've never been more sick for a fan base that was not my own. I legitimately felt ill for those people because we all know what that feeling is like. We rewind to the 13 second game and remember what you felt like in that moment. That is what 
the Detroit Lions fan base felt like yesterday. But I'd almost argue maybe worse because in the Bills-Chiefs game, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, the Bills never had a stranglehold on that game. It was never at a point where you were saying, man, you know, the Bills are far and away the better team today. The, the Lions dominated the San Francisco 49ers for 30 straight minutes of football. And within eight minutes of the third quarter, a 17-point lead instantly evaporated when you mix in a variety of horrendous coaching decisions, a fumble on your own 25-yard line. Next thing you knew, a team that was about to be on the precipice of making their first ever Super Bowl appearance watches it vanish in thin air in a game that Lions fans will never forget in a game where Dan Campbell, Jared Goff, and the variety of studs on that Detroit Lions team will lose sleep over maybe for the rest of time. A crazy finish in that game. The much better game. The AFC Championship game stunk. An awful game. Started off hot, right? Chiefs score first. Ravens immediately answer. Chiefs then answer again. We would get six total points. After that Chiefs answer, Chiefs go up 14 to seven. They add a field goal right before half due to two horrendous personal foul penalties committed by the Baltimore Ravens. They take that 17 to seven lead into half and there wouldn't be another point added on the scoreboard until a garbage time field goal by Justin Tucker. That meant nothing with around two minutes remaining in the game. A pitiful performance by a Baltimore Ravens team that felt like they were the best team in the league this season. If there was any argument between them and San Francisco, well, we watched them beat the living shit out of the San Francisco 49ers. And it felt after that moment, there was certainly no doubt that the Ravens were the team to beat. But of course, here it is again. The Kansas City Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes, off to the greatest start in the history of maybe sports. Under Patrick Mahomes, I've never seen anything like what we're witnessing currently. And it's incredible because even yesterday, and we talk about this all the time, the credit uh, given to the quarterback, the blame given to the quarterback. Mahomes had a great first couple of series. There's no question about it. And Travis Kelsey arises from the dead, nowhere to be found for the last couple of months, goes off against the Bills for two touchdowns. And yesterday, 11 targets, 11 catches, over 100 yards and a touchdown. He's back to pure first ballot Hall of Fame form. It's incredible. The Ravens were the better roster. They were the better team. They were better on both sides of the ball on paper going into that game. And they got embarrassed. Seven points. Not a legitimate point scored again after their second drive of the football game. Remarkable. Appreciate everyone who tuned in yesterday. We live streamed both games. It was a blast. We were live for what? Eight straight hours. Had a couple of tequilas and we hung out. That was a ball. So shout out to everybody who joined me for championship weekend yesterday. I had a great time with you. And I'm glad we got a better game in the second one. Even though uh, if you were like me, it, 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 it did not go the way you were hoping. I was hoping to have a legitimate rooting interest in the Super Bowl. You know how it goes. It's the annual tradition for us Bills fans. Bills get bounced. Okay, who do we hate the least here that we can pull for? Or, you know, who do you hate so much that the opponent, you know, he, he's, he's going to be a rooting interest by default simply because you hate the opponent so much? I can't stand the San Francisco 49ers, but I, I, I can't stand the Chiefs a whole hell of a lot more. So I'm at a, I'm at a crossroads here because I have now bet against Patrick Mahomes as an underdog probably four or five times in my life a couple of uh, a couple of them against the Bills I have lost every single time and most anybody who's ever bet against Patrick Mahomes as an underdog has lost every single time he is now 10 one in one against the spread as an underdog it, it is it is unprecedented shit what else is new everything the guy does is unprecedented so I, I will not be making that mistake again I have to bet on the Chiefs. We'll talk about the betting lines coming up in a little bit because they're interesting. It's basically a pick em at this point. We'll get into the betting lines a little bit later for that game. Take a look and see what might be interesting to get in on for that game. So you do have some rooting interest. But I can't, I can't bet against the guy again. I can't bet against the guy again. And after what I've seen from the 49ers two weeks in a row, they should have lost the first-year starter, Jordan Love, and the Green Bay Packers. And they sure as hell should have lost yesterday. 
to a Detroit Lions team that is powered by mostly first and second year studs. And of course, Jared Goff should have lost both of those games, somehow won it. But the great teams always find a way, don't they? Always find a way. And that is, of course, what the San Francisco 49ers did. And they will be uh, moving on to the Super Bowl. And as we know, the Chiefs find a way every single time. So we look at it as Bills fans today, shortly after the game yesterday. And we all know hindsight's 2020. It always is, especially uh, us Bills fans. We have crystal clear 2020 hindsight in moments like this. And there, it was never clearer, I, I believe, our, our vision, our 2020 vision back when the 13 seconds occurred because we had all felt that was the moment in time where the Buffalo Bills had their best chance to win it all. And it still feels to this day like it very well could have been, very well might be. But I would argue that this year was the closest second they've had. You could probably argue it was maybe even a better situation because they had the Chiefs at home. It might be ruled out because of how banged up their defense was, but many would have argued that that might have been ruled out because of the struggles the Kansas City Chiefs offense was having. But as we've seen the last three weeks, those struggles during the regular season, those struggles that couldn't be Aiden O'Connell on Christmas Day, who had 70 yards of total offense through the air, has somehow come back to the vintage Chiefs we've, we've known and hated. Right? So we sit here and reflect. And oftentimes we convince ourselves they could have won it all, even though they probably couldn't have or wouldn't have. I've never felt more convinced that the Bills had their best chance than I do now. And that's what makes the loss from last week sting even more. Just when you think you're overcoming that heartbreaking loss, you add more salt to a wound that was starting to heal. Because you watch yesterday and you realize a variety of things. But nothing more than the fact the Bills would have had a legitimate, if not great, chance to knock off that Baltimore Ravens team that took the field yesterday. So let's talk about what we, as Buffalo Bills fans, learned from championship weekend. And let's start right there. What we learned is the Bills are still maybe not going forward. We don't know what changes are going to happen. We don't know who the Bills are going to have to move on from in free agency, who's going to retire, this, that. We don't know what additions other AFC teams are going to make and they get better. We don't know, right? But I'm talking about in this moment right now, the the last several seasons, the Bills are unarguably, unarguably the second, third best team in the, in the AFC. And this year, they were the second best team in the AFC. You saw it on display yesterday. Even though the Ravens throughout the duration of the season were the best team in the league, arguably, you saw yesterday what they put out on display against the same team the Bills played a week ago, a week prior. And it clicks. The Bills were the best chance the Chiefs had to lose this entire offseason or this entire postseason. The Bills, therefore, they had the best chance to finally knock off the Chiefs, not allow them to go to a sixth consecutive AFC championship, and finally get over the hump. It was not even close. Let's talk about what the Chiefs have done in this postseason so far. They go out in the wild card round against the Miami Dolphins team that not only was banged up on defense, of course, but is a team that we knew knew wholeheartedly could not adequately compete in that type of environment. Whipping winds, freezing cold. We knew the Dolphins were going to lose that game before they even got off the bus. And that, of course, is what happened. But even I was a bit shocked that despite the fact that the Kansas City Chiefs settled for four field goals in that game, they still won a playoff game against the Miami Dolphins team that at one point had a legitimate chance for the one seed. They beat that team by 19 points, destroyed them. They scored one touchdown the entire football game, and it was a duck. It was a seven-yard underthrow from Tua Tonga by Loa. Tyreek Hill bails him out, breaks a tackle, scores a touchdown. They never sniff scoring position after that. Utter domination. What happens yesterday? The Ravens score a touchdown on their second possession, and it was a remarkable touchdown. It almost reminds you of the exact same touchdown the Dolphins had with Tua 
in the wild card round, except it was a much better play by the quarterback. Lamar Jackson does a pirouette out of a sack, defies logic itself getting out of it, and throws a dime for a touchdown in the back of the end zone. You're thinking, man, if Lamar is going to be making plays like that today, we're going to have ourselves a ball game. They wouldn't run another play in enemy territory until the second half. The Ravens went into the half with two plays in opponent territory. They would score three more points. And like I said earlier, they were go ahead and have them junk time points from Justin Tucker where they tried to get an onside kick that failed miserably. So, those are the two opponents the Chiefs have fade out, faced outside of the Bills, and it's been utter domination. One of, the, one of the opponents in the Dolphins, it wasn't as shocking, mainly because of the elements, mainly because of the injuries on defense. We knew how banged up Miami was, and it wasn't even just defense. They were banged up everywhere. Tyreek Hill was hobbled up. Jalen Waddle was hobbled up, hobbled up. Raheem Mostert, Xavier Howard, plus they lost essentially their entire pass rush but it was the weather that was truly the icing on top. And I think that's why we saw the domination, or at least that's what we thought. I had convinced myself, no, the Chiefs aren't back. The Dolphins are just frauds. We've known this for a while. They were never going to win that game. And when you, when you can't get a first down the entire game, of course the Chiefs are going to be scoring points at will. Even if they are settling for field goals, they're getting the ball at the 40-yard line every time they start. So I chalked it up as, no, the Chiefs aren't back. They still haven't flipped that switch. It's more because the Dolphins aren't any good, right? And then yesterday, they get off to a blazing hot start. They somehow fizzle out on offense. 17 points going into half. They don't score another point the entire game. It doesn't matter. They somehow find a way. Domination on defense. It was domination on defense with a mix of just really bad play by the Ravens. There's really no other way to put it. Lamar Jackson had a horrendous day. Zay Flowers, brutal. Forgettable days all around. Commendable performance by the Ravens defense. It looked like they were going to get boat raced early on. You want to talk about answering the call. They allow 14 points on two consecutive drives, and they did not allow the Chiefs to do anything the rest of the game. Where was the offense? On a milk carton. Nowhere to be found. So let's go to the game in the middle. And that, of course, is the divisional round game in Buffalo against these Bills where Josh Allen is highly criticized. Josh Allen takes the brunt of the blame, even though I argue maybe 5 to 10% max was on the back of Josh Allen in a game that would not even have been remotely competitive if it weren't not for 17 at quarterback. That game not only saw a lot of criticism come to Josh Allen's way, but it saw a lot of criticism come to Joe Brady's way. We'll talk about him in a little bit. He was just recently named the full-time offensive coordinator for these Buffalo Bills. We'll dive into that after we talk about championship weekend here. But Joe Brady took a lot of criticism as well. Hated the game plan. Everybody hated the game plan. You got Josh Allen at uh, at quarterback, one of the greatest athletes to ever play the position. Cannon for an arm. We all know what he can do through the air. Why are we running the ball so much? Why are we dinking and dunking it so much? Why are we not trying to open the field up and go and go air raid on these guys and reopen another version of the 13 second game? Looks a little foolish today, doesn't it? Having that take after that loss last week. The Dolphins score seven points against the Chiefs. And you're thinking maybe it was due to the weather. Weather wasn't an issue yesterday in Baltimore. Their first AFC championship in over 50 years at home. Best team in the league, arguably. Scored seven points before a garbage time field goal. Josh Allen, who took all that heat, Joe Brady, who took all that heat for that trash game plan, 24 points against that Chiefs team, 10 more, or excuse me, a touchdown more rather, than the two other playoff teams scored against the Chiefs combined, with a chance to win it at the end, and an even better chance to tie it. We all know what happened on that attempt. I had argued immediately after that game, if you tuned into the smoke break the night after that game, one of the first things I said was I did not understand the criticism of the play to, or, or the game plan offensively. 
The only reason that game plan was getting criticized, the only reason Josh Allen was getting criticized was because of the final two plays of the game. And hey, deservingly so. But you can't take a two-play sample size and make it the entire sample size. Everybody wanted to make that game out to be a poor, a poorly executed uh, game plan by Joe Brady and Josh Allen, a poor game offensively. It's interesting, however, the Chiefs ran the exact same game plan that the Bills had against the Chiefs the week prior. They ran that same game plan yesterday against these Ravens. Only difference is they made the plays that counted the most when they, or they made the plays they needed when they counted the most. They force a fumble from Zay Flowers going into the end zone. They pick off Lamar Jackson when they get back towards scoring uh, position. They score enough in the first half to give themselves a comfortable lead, even though it was only 17 points, the defense took over. It was the same exact game plan. But the Chiefs found a way where the Bills didn't. Now, of course, that's got a lot to do with the fact that the Bills' defense was a shell of itself against the Chiefs. They were anemic. A.J. Klein, packing up his van, getting ready for a family vacay. He's got to go and cover Travis Kelsey, who all of a sudden is the greatest to ever play again. So it's a little bit of a different playing field. But let's face it, if Lamar Jackson has even a mediocre day yesterday, the Ravens win that game. If Zay Flowers doesn't taunt Legereus Sneed on, a, on one of their only positive plays of the game, back him up, and then proceed to fumble the ball in the end zone, maybe the Ravens win that game despite not even playing a mediocre game. The Bills, the week prior, had their best had the best performance any team has had against these Chiefs when the games matter the most this season. And the Chiefs would be getting criticized today if the Ravens do somehow just have a mediocre game and wind up winning that. Or if Zay Flowers does hang on to the ball and get into the end zone and they wind up winning that. The Chiefs get criticized if that winds up happening due to their inability to score in the second half. You see a complete opposite tone today because they won it. You see the tone of, well, hey, Travis Kelsey, he's back, right? Mahomes, he's back. This offense is back. You've barely even heard much about the defense for the Chiefs that held this Ravens team to essentially seven points the entire game. And that's exactly what the narrative would have been last week if the Bills held on to win. Except I'd argue the Bills executed their game plan even further than the Chiefs did yesterday. It's just the Ravens absolutely pissed themselves whereas the Chiefs did not against these Bills. The Bills get out of there last week with a win. Say Josh Allen decides to go to Stephon Diggs instead of Khalil Shakir. Say Josh Allen doesn't get bumped into by Dawkins and Chris Jones, and Khalil Shakir catches that ball. Say Tyler Bass makes the field goal, and it, the impossible happens, and the Chiefs don't go down and win it. The Bills get the ball back and win. Oh, the game plan would have been, it would have been excellent. Would have been being praised. Josh Allen would have been getting praised. This is why context matters. The game plan from last week was more than adequate. In fact, I thought it was the best possible game plan they could have had for that situation, knowing how banged up their defense was. What did you want them to do differently? Outside of, of course, the final two plays. And you know how in agreement I am with that. I wanted that ball to go to Stephon Diggs every time. In that situation, I never understood going for the home run ball. I never understood not trying to move the sticks and work the clock because when you're playing the Chiefs and Mahomes, working the clock is almost just as important as scoring points are. So I never understood going for the home run ball. But we don't know if that's on the shoulders of Brady or on Josh Allen. I figured it's probably on Josh Allen unless Brady phones down and says go for the end zone. But the way that they were executing that game plan all game, I don't personally believe that's the case. He'd been taking the underneath routes all game long. Why, why go away from it? That's why it hurts so much. That's why it made so little sense. That's why they were getting ripped apart. But in totality, thought that game plan was excellent. They had a 37-minute of uh, possession time advantage. 37 minutes of possession to the Chiefs thir uh, 23. The Chiefs yesterday did the exact same thing. They kept Lamar Jackson off the field. They held on to the ball almost the entire game. The second half was not going according to plan compared to the first half. But with the Ravens shooting themselves in the foot and the Chiefs defense really stepping up, it never wound up mattering. 
But everybody the next day, it wasn't even just ripping the game plan. It was beyond that. It was let's blow this whole thing up. Let's fire McDermott tonight. Fire Sean McDermott tonight. I can't take another divisional round loss. And I understand it's heat of the moment. We all get that way. God knows I've gotten that way. But even in the moment of the loss, I never looked at that game and said, let's can McDermott, who just had this essentially YMCA roster defense out there going against Mahomes and the the Chiefs who have somehow regained their stride when it seemed like they had no stride to regain throughout the year. Everybody wanted McDermott gone the next day. Everybody wants to move on from Diggs the next day. Did Diggs have a great game? Hell no. God no. Far from it. Was it Sean McDermott's greatest outing? Certainly not. The fake punt, one of the worst play calls I've seen in a while. Another exit for Sean McDermott against Andy Reid. Was he outcoached by Andy Reid? More than likely. Was he at a disadvantage? Certainly. Let's take a look at what we're dealing with. Because what I said last Monday is never more true than it is right now. It's not that the Bills need to blow it up. It's not that the Bills are a bad team. In fact, they're far from it. They're one of the league's best. The only difference is that they're not the Kansas City Chiefs. But what else did I say? I said the Bills aren't the Kansas City Chiefs, but the reality is nobody else in the league is either. And you saw it again yesterday. There wasn't a moment this entire season where you felt the Kansas City Chiefs were the superior team to the Baltimore Ravens. Yet. In Ravens territory, in the biggest game of the year, on the road, apparently that was going to be a disadvantage for Mahomes and the Chiefs. They made them look like the Carolina Panthers. You don't think Bryce Young and the Carolina Panthers could have mustered up a touchdown yesterday? I think they could have. They looked no better than the worst team in the league. The Bills were a missed field goal or an executed second and nine, third and nine away from beating that team. Everybody wants to blow it up fire the coach, move on from X, Y, and Z. Does this team need to improve? Oh, certainly. Do they need to go into this draft and just start peppering young offensive weapons like the rest of these teams seem to do around their quarterback, the Packers, right? The Lions, the Texans, what the Chiefs will certainly probably do this offseason? Absolutely. I'm not talking about getting complacent, but there's a difference between complacency and wanting to blow the whole thing up. These Bills absolutely have to improve. And they're going to do everything in their power to do that. And I hope they do it in a way this offseason that is not necessarily what they've done in the past. Because what they've done in the past, it's going to really start to burn them even more coming up here. I mean, you watch yesterday with these Detroit Lions. The amount of young talent on that team, it's the reason they're there yesterday. Jameer Gibbs, Amon Ross St. Brown, Aiden Hutchinson, Sam Laporta. All these guys, first, second year, third year, it's it's incredible what they're building in D- Detroit with all these young guys around them. We already saw Dalton Kincaid, the first ever first-round draft pick these Bills have spent on an offensive weapon for Josh Allen. He had a terrific year, and he only got better and better and better and better as the year went on. And as you saw in the playoffs, he was one of Josh Allen's best target. Maybe outside of Shakir, he was his best target. Imagine what they can do if they continue to add. If they continue to get better pieces, young pieces that they can keep on the roster for a while, grow around Josh Allen and get him cheap because we all know they're salary capped. They're they're salary cap strapped going into this coming season. But you feel two different ways today. You feel worse because you know the Bills could have won that game yesterday. Certainly could have beat the Chiefs, had them. The way that if the Ravens showed up the way they did yesterday, Bills are winning that ball game. And I don't know what it is. I have no fear of the San Francisco 49ers whatsoever. If Jordan Love had a lick of experience in the playoffs, I think that they win that game 10 out of 10 times. They blew it in the final stages. Brock Purdy went from having the worst game of his career to finally getting a a decent drive under his belt, wins the game late. And then yesterday, 24 to 7, ESPN analytics had the the Detroit Lions at a 91% chance to win the ball game. Do I think the Bills could have beaten the Niners on a neutral field? Hell yeah. So I sit here today, as I'm sure many of you do, you sit here and you feel a lot worse knowing they easily could have won. I mean, let's not say easily. (laughs) Nothing's easy. But they would have had as good a chance as anybody. 
The reason I felt almost a bit better about the situation after the Chiefs loss is because I had felt, look at the way that this Bills team is currently stacked up defensively. I don't know if they're going to be able to go into Baltimore and compete. The reason I thought that, go back and look at what the Ravens did all year long against the league's best opponents. I'm sure there were plenty of us that felt as though the Bills were going to have a rough day against the uh, the Ravens should they have moved on. They beat the Dolphins 56 to 19. They beat the Texans in the divisional 34 to 10. We all know what they did to the Niners 33 to 19. They beat the Seahawks 37 to 3. They beat the Lions who had those 49ers on the ropes yesterday. They beat the Lions 38 to 6. This team was dominating. Any team worth a damn this year. They beat the Cleveland Browns 28 to 3. Texans first week of the season. Again, 25 to 9, the same team they roll in the second half in the divisional. They were pounding everybody's ass. So it would have been a fair assumption to assume the Bills go into the bank yesterday and struggle. But if that team that waltzed out there yesterday waltzed out against the Bills, no chance. Bills would have been the better team. Bills would have had a terrific chance to move on. And I'd be sitting here saying the same thing about them facing off against the San Francisco 49ers in a couple weeks. I'd love their chances. So you feel like shit about that. But there's got to be a part of you that does feel a bit better about the situation as well. You don't feel great about the fact that the Bills blew it in the end like they become accustomed to doing over the last handful of seasons. You don't feel great about that at all. You still feel shitty about the Bills' inability to get over the hump in these final moments, these these little nooks and crannies of the game that ultimately end up being the difference. But I go back to what I just said. Nobody else is doing it either. The Chiefs are now on their, they, they just had their sixth consecutive AFC East championship appearance under Patrick Mahomes. Now four Super Bowl appearances. Their two AFC championship losses, one of them, the first one, was an overtime to Tom Brady at the end of the dynasty. And one was an 18-point blown lead to the Cincinnati Bengals, another overtime loss. They're two fractions away in overtime from six consecutive Super Bowl appearances. So it's not that the Bills are far and away from the league's top. We thought the Ravens were the league's best. Bills looked like the far superior team with a far worse defense a week ago. That Ravens defense yesterday was as healthy as it gets. Travis Kelsey made them look pedestrian. They have one of the best linebacking cores in the league, maybe the best linebacker in the league in Roquan Smith. They got gobbled up all game long. The middle of the field was wide open. The Bills with the far inferior defense the week before looked like the far superior team to the Baltimore Ravens, who all year long looked like the best team in the league. So there's got to be part of you today that feels good knowing it really, it, it, it's crazy to say it's not all its not all about the Bills themselves, their inability to do this. It, it, it's the ability the Chiefs have that nobody else has, and I cannot find a way to adequately describe it. Because how do you adequately describe what you've never seen before? That's what the Chiefs are doing. And the unfortunate reality is that Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, they're all going to be on the outside looking in of this. They have been and they will be until we're proven otherwise. Because even when Joe Burrow got over the hump and beat Mahomes, he didn't take advantage of it. He didn't capitalize. They lose to the Rams in the Super Bowl. And that's the only time since Tom Brady that anybody's had a crack out of the AFC at getting it done. Think about it. The two greatest dynasties in the last 25 years. There's one team out of the last six seasons that wasn't including either the Patriots or the Chiefs, and that team couldn't get it done. So we're talking about six years in this league with Mahomes being a starter, six years in this league where nobody in the AFC has taken advantage of any opportunity. And it makes you wonder, are they that? Are they just that much worse, or is it that the Chiefs are just that much different? And I can't even say it's that the Chiefs are just that much better because I don't think that they are. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to describe it. They weren't that much better than the Bills on the field last week. On paper, they're not better at all than the Baltimore Ravens. But it just somehow goes their way. The Ravens play terrible. 
The Ravens play terrible. The Chiefs don't score another point the rest of the game after halftime, and they win it going away. How is that possible? And the answer is nobody knows. It, it sucks that all of these great quarterbacks, including our own, is on the outside looking in of historic shit. It's sickening. The Bills were on the shortest end of the stick imaginable against the greatest dynasty in the history of sports, the New England Patriots. What was Tom Brady against the Bills? 36 and 3. But it never felt as bad because the Bills were never any good. They weren't competing for the AFC East title. They weren't competing against the Patriots in the playoffs. So it was easier to brush off. This is why this sucks so bad. The Bills are finally good. In fact, the Bills are finally great. But there's a difference between great and historic. The Chiefs are historic. The Patriots are historic. The Ravens are a great team. The Bills are a great team. When the Bengals are healthy, they're a great team. They're not this. And I don't know what this is. You don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is. I think when you're at a complete loss for words at, in your ability to describe what you are witnessing, that means you are witnessing history. And it makes me sick to my stomach to have to sit on here and wax poetically about this team that's ruined my life for the last half decade or so. But what else can I do? What else am, what else am I able to do? Honesty and transparency is always at the forefront for me. I, I can't stand the Kansas City Chiefs more than anybody, but <laughs> you better believe I respect them. And I don't know if I've had any more respect for anything, anything more than this. I had this team counted out dead in the water, as many of us did. They had not flipped a switch all year long. They had showed no ability to flip a switch. In games where you'd think that they were the superior team, they lose. The Denver Broncos, they scored nine points at a loss against the Broncos. 14 points, Christmas Day, Aiden O'Connell. What was he, 7-12 in that game? Lose. And this, all of a sudden, when the, when the lights are the brightest, the stage is the biggest. Taylor Swift's in town with Jason Kelsey. There they are, back to the old Chiefs. So we're going to sit around here and we're going to say, blow it all up, fire McDermott. I mean, how many, it's getting to the point, how many things did you see the past week that involved trade scenarios for Josh Allen? Now, of course, all of those posts were made by utter buffoons, but you'd never seen them prior to that. That's where we got, where it was like, this is what is happening. This is, what it's, it's what's, this is what's happening. I've said it before. If the Chiefs were in the NFC, how many AFC East championship appearances do the Bills have? How many Super Bowl appearances do they have? Ravens fans probably saying the same. Bengals fans might be saying the same. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to describe it. But all I know is I watched three games that these Chiefs had to endure in this playoffs. The Bills were by far the best team that they played and by far gave them their best run and had by far their best crack at beating them. So to those who want to blow it all up and fire everybody and criticize every single thing that they did last week, you can't tell me that with a straight face after what you watched the Chiefs do to everybody else. When you factor in that the Bills had the most banged up defense imaginable, when you factor in that the Bills should have, could have won that game in the final minutes, you can't tell me that all of it was terrible. And I'm in the same boat as all of you. All I want is what we've not got. Shout out Dave Matthews. But what I want seems almost impossible, and it's what everybody else wants. That's not a fan of the Kansas City Chiefs. There's 31 other fan bases that want what that fan base has, and they can't have it because they took it all. I find myself continuously trying to explain this to my fiance, Caroline, because, you know, she's kind of enamored with the whole Taylor Swift thing. She's a big Taylor Swift fan and not that she's obsessed with it, but she's curious about the whole situation. You come to find out Taylor Swift has generated almost $400 million in revenue for the NFL this year. They, they calculated her marketing value to the NFL this year, nearly $400 million in free publicity. I mean, what we're watching, it's not only just historic, but but when you add on top of it all of these other elements, the fact that Taylor Swift is in the booth, all this shit, you imagine being a fan of this and you imagine what the situation we're in being on the outside looking in. I, I mean, imagine if this was the Bills. Imagine the superiority complex you'd have. We'd be the biggest assholes on the internet, and rightfully so. There's no way, there's no good way to put it. 
And it makes you that much more sick because as Josh Allen said in the, po- in the post-game presser, we just got to find a way to score one more point than they have, than they are. But somehow the Chiefs find a way to score one more point than you every single time. What's Mahomes' record in the playoffs now? 14-3. and three. It is the greatest six-season postseason run as far as wins are concerned in NFL history. The, Bill- the Bills and everybody else are just on the wrong side of it. And of course, the only person, there are three times Mahomes has lost. And the only person that made it count was the leader of the evil empire, who you would argue we can't stand more than Mahomes and, and, uh, and, uh, and the Chiefs. And that's Tom Brady. Tom Brady beats him in the AFC Championship in Mahomes' first year as a starter. He beats him in the Super Bowl with his first year with the Bucs. Think about that. Mahomes is 14-3 and three in, the, in, the, uh, in the playoffs. And two of those losses are to the greatest of all time. It's not that the Bills are a Grand Canyon away. Not that the Bills aren't good enough. They're just not that, and neither is anybody else. And you just wonder if time will eventually weigh on these Chiefs and things end up going a different direction. But we have a six-year sample size, and we haven't been given any reason to think it. In fact, no, I, that's wrong. We were given reason to think it this entire, this entire regular season. And we all wound up looking like fools. So it's a weird spot to be in as a Bills fan today. You feel shitty knowing, man, I really do think the Bills could have gone the distance if the end of that game just goes a little bit differently. But you also feel somewhat decent knowing there's 31 other teams trying to get this done against these Chiefs, and the Bills have had the best crack at them than anybody else has outside of the Bengals, and even that team could not get it done either. I mean, what's the difference? Would I, would I have much rather have had a Super Bowl appearance by now just to get there? You know how much I talk about just wanting to get there. I would. So I would love to have had what the Bengals had got to the Super Bowl despite losing. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Nobody remembers who lost. Nobody cares. Losing in the Divisional, what's the difference? You lose, you lose in the Divisional, you lose in the Super Bowl, you go home. You don't have a ring. You get the same Constellation prize. Like, okay, yes, the Bills get an AFC title. Like I said, I would love that. I'd swap for that in a second. But they still never maximized on it. We got six years here. Six years. The only team, the only player that took advantage of these six years and were able to get over the hump of Mahomes was Tom effing Brady. It's disgusting. It's insane. It leaves you at a loss for words. Because the, you now sit around the entire offseason. We've sat around the last couple of weeks. And you say, what can we do? What can we do differently? What can we do? And, and does, I don't know. Does anybody know? Because if anybody knew, make him the highest paid coach in the world right now. If you know how to figure out how to beat this. The Bills had him in a shootout into the 40s, lost. The Bills had him in a low-scoring, you know, hold hold the the time of possession all the way to the end type game, lost. Yesterday, Chiefs don't score in the second half. Win. Doesn't matter what happens, what you do, what they do. It just seems to go their way every time. I've never seen anything quite like it in my life. Ugh. And I think the Chiefs 100% win two weeks from, yes- from yesterday. I 100%. You know I've said that from the jump here. I said the winner of the AFC Championships winning that game. You can't tell me the way that the, the, the Niners have looked recently that you don't think that the Chiefs are going to take advantage of that. They're going to win it. They're going to win it. He's going to get his third ring. He's going to get his third Super Bowl ring in three years. And three of those years were at the hands of the Buffalo Bills at some point in the playoffs. In fact, according to advanced analytics, this year, 
for the Chiefs was the most improbable, difficult Super Bowl run in NFL history. According to the advanced analytics, it even trumps the 2007 New York Giants, who, in my opinion, had the greatest Super Bowl run in the history of the sport. If you beat an, uh, an 18-0 and team that was averaging early, in the, through the first, I think, 12 weeks of the season for the, for the Randy Moss, Tom Brady, 2007 Chiefs, through the first 12 weeks, I believe, of the season, they were beating teams by more points than the average amount of points were being scored per team in the NFL. And the Giants beat them after going on the road and beating Brett Favre and I forget who else. It was, it was improbable. It was incredible. It was insane. But according to the numbers, what the Chiefs have done this year, beating the Dolphins, going on the road and beating the Bills, and going on the road and beating the MVP, and we'll talk about that in a second, and Lamar Jackson and the, and the Baltimore Ravens, it, it has been the, the most improbable run in the history of, of, the, of the sport. So once again, it's back to the point I've been making for the last 20 minutes here. No matter whether they have the greatest path to get there or the most difficult path in the history of the NFL, they get there regardless. So what are we supposed to do? What are the Ravens supposed to do? What are the Bills supposed to do? What are the uh, the Browns supposed to do and the Bengals supposed to do and the Jaguars supposed to do and all the teams that are on the outside looking in or close or you know, a little bit up here, a little bit down here? Nobody has a damn clue because there's no answer. And there hasn't been an answer for over a half decade. Let's talk about the MVP situation. Let's talk about Lamar Jackson's performance yesterday. Let's talk about another da dash of salt in the wound. There's an argument out there that Josh Allen gets too much love. Josh Allen gets too much credit for not winning anything. Josh Allen shouldn't be on the cover of Madden. Josh Allen hasn't done anything. Why should he be considered one of the greatest? Why should he be considered the Manning to Brady or to Mahomes' Brady? Why should he be considered in the MVP conversation? And my answer to that is, why the hell not? My question to you would be, what have you been watching? We're talking about a guy that just came off of his fourth consecutive year with 40-plus touchdowns. Josh Allen had 50-plus touchdowns this season. Late on, later on in the season this year, the Ravens had been dominating all year, but they had been dominating collectively. The Ravens probably had the best defense in the entire league. Their run game is stout. There was a point in time where I think going into the final game against the Steelers where they played their backups, the Ravens had had 100-plus yards on the ground in like some insane number. It was like 20, 30 straight games. It was insane. Great run game, great defense, tons of studs on that team. And Lamar Jackson, of course, the, the, the prime stud, their best player, their captain, their leader, their quarterback. I love Lamar Jackson. He's one of my favorite players ever to watch. I love him. It's plays like yesterday that he makes on that second drive where they score their lone touchdown where you're like, wow, how lucky are we to be able to get to watch this guy? He played terrible yesterday, however. He had that great play. Outside of that, he was abysmal. And it wasn't just him. Zay Flowers did him no help, did him no favors. His offensive coordinator did him no favors. His offensive line sure as hell didn't do him any favors. But it's funny, today I'm not hearing a whole lot of dogging Lamar for that game yesterday. Today I'm not hearing a whole lot of that was Lamar Jackson's fault. Why? Because if that was Josh Allen yesterday, that would be all that I would be hearing. In fact, I heard it last week when the guy had one of the best quarterback performances of the playoffs. When the guy had all three of the team's touchdowns. When the guy was the best running back on the field in addition to going toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the greatest, if not the greatest quarterback in the history of the sport. And it comes down to the same sentiment that we're dealing with, with with the MVP here. I don't know what's so polarizing about Josh Allen to the general public. I don't get it. 
No, he doesn't have the accolades of Patrick Mahomes. So he should not be considered better than Patrick Mahomes. Is it fair that we judge these players, quarterbacks in particular, based on team accolades alone? No, certainly not. But I'm not going to fight the wave because reality is reality. And no matter what I think, it's not going to change what's already set in stone. And what's set in stone is that nobody gives a damn about what you're doing outside of what your trophy case has on display. But you mean to tell me the three best quarterbacks in the league over the last handful of seasons, really since they've entered the league, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen. Lamar is going to have his second MVP. Mahomes is going to have two MVPs, could have three Super Bowl uh, MVPs as well as three Super Bowl championships. You mean to tell me out of all those three, Josh Allen, the, the most he's got to show for all this is a Madden cover? Mahomes and Lamar have that too. What is so polarizing about Josh Allen? Why is he so passed on when it comes to these things? I understand he doesn't have a Super Bowl ring. Neither does Lamar. Lamar has two playoff wins. One of them came this year against a rookie quarterback. You don't ever hear, or I I shouldn't say that, you do hear the scrutiny when it comes to Lamar in the playoffs. But why is it today that we're not scrutinizing him more because of what happened yesterday, where I feel like if that was Josh Allen, he would be getting the entirety of the of the scrutiny. Why is it that when we talk about Josh Allen, it seems like we tend to bring up the playoff failures far more often than we bring up the Baltimore Ravens and the uh, Lamar Jackson failures? Maybe it's because Lamar's barely been in playoff games. What has he played in now? Five of them? He's got two wins. I have no problem with Lamar Jackson being the MVP. As you know, I've pounded the table on this time and time again on this show. There are three players currently in the league that I think should be on rotation for MVP. That's Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, and Josh Allen. Because you cannot argue to me that there are, there's not, you cannot argue to me outside of those three players that there is a single other player more valuable to their organization than one of those three guys. Sorry, that includes Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow went down this year. The Bengals were still right on the edge of making the playoffs. If Josh Allen goes down, the Bills are out of the playoffs and eliminated before Christmas. Well before Christmas, probably around Thanksgiving time. And that's no shot at Joe Burrow. He's easily a top five quarterback in this league. I'm talking about valuable. Because what the Bills have built around Josh Allen, it is so Josh Allen-centric that if he were not on the field, this team would not be over 500. Neither would the Chiefs. And as we've seen with the Ravens, they wouldn't be a shell of themselves either. This is the healthiest Lamar has been going into December, and it showed. They were able to get the one seed. They were able to go the distance, or at least up to the finish line. They couldn't cross it. But why is it that those other two have two MVPs? We understand Patrick Mahomes. That makes a lot of sense. But how does Lamar Jackson have two MVPs now to Josh Allen's one or to Josh Allen's zero? Understandably, when Lamar Jackson won it in his second year as a starter, he had had one of the greatest NFL seasons of all time. His numbers were off the charts. You can't dispute it. No question about it. He wins the MVP there. I'm talking about this season in particular. The Ravens in two consecutive weeks. Mind you, the MVP race was so wide open. You had pundits telling you Brock Purdy should win it all. Brock Purdy should be the MVP. You kidding me? You watched the last month of football. Can you believe we were even having that conversation? I don't want to say we, because I certainly wasn't a part of it. But can you believe people were having that conversation? That is how up in the air, uncertain the MVP race was. We were trying to throw position players in there who haven't won an MVP since Adrian Peterson a decade ago. Why? Well, that's because there was no surefire winner. But then the Ravens go into San Francisco and Brock Purdy messes himself. 
uh, Lamar has a great night. The Ravens have a great night. They beat the hell out of the Niners. Then they go on to beat the Dolphins 56 to 19. And within a two week time span, we go from being told that Brock Purdy's the MVP to all of a sudden, not only is Lamar the MVP, he is unanimous. There's not even a debate. It's not even a question. Lamar Jackson is the MVP. And for the last month now, we have been talking about Lamar Jackson, including myself, as if he already won the MVP. And that's frankly because he's going to win it. The question is, why was it so set in stone? Why was Lamar Jackson's MVP written in ink a month before the voting started? And why was Josh Allen not more considered? I'll say it again. I have no problem with Lamar Jackson winning the MVP. He's one of my favorite players to watch in this entire league. I love the guy. I think he's great. I love everything about that dude, including the fact that the Ravens, for whatever reason, took a fifth-year option on a guy who already had an MVP under his belt in his second season. I understand the injury history. <laughs> Lamar, no doubt about it, top-five quarterback in this league. They took him to the fifth-year option. Meanwhile, you got Dolphins fans trying to, trying to give you an argument as to why they should max out Tua. Please do it. I'm begging you. Lamar bets on himself. Hell, he didn't even have an agent. Goes, gets his bag, comes out this year, and he leads the Ravens to the one seed. I have all the respect in the world for the guy. I have no problem with him winning it. I have a problem with everybody putting him down in pen a month before the voting started without even giving consideration to the fact that Josh Allen just had an all-time season with a team that was six feet under 12 weeks through the year. And the only argument they have to give you is that he's a turnover machine. But they don't want to bring up the fact that he had over 50 touchdowns on the year. So I'll say it again. Why is it that it seems to be the heaviest cross to bear for Josh Allen while these other guys get to kind of just waltz up the hill with a whole hell of a lot less on their back? I don't quite get it. Is it because... CBS plays the intro where they're trying to coin it as the next Brady Manning and he comes up short. And when I say he, I mean the team because I don't feel Josh Allen has come up short at all against these uh, Chiefs the last couple of seasons. Go look at the numbers. Is it because he hasn't won the whole thing? Well, I can't believe that that's the case because Lamar Jackson's got an infinitely worse resume in the playoffs. So that shouldn't matter. I had a problem with it to begin with, but I watched yesterday unfold. Within a one-week time span, we watched Josh Allen play that Chiefs team. We watched Lamar Jackson play that Chiefs team. And we all know the voting's already been done and over with, and we all know that the playoffs don't factor into these MVP votes, except they totally do, just not in the moment. But it'll factor in next year and the year after and the year after because you remember those things. You allow that bias from previous years to creep into it. These things are all political. They always have been. They always will be. But I just wonder why every time you talk about Josh Allen, it's he's a turnover machine. It's not, holy shit, that guy's the entire team. He just had 50-plus touchdowns. He just had four consecutive seasons with 40-plus touchdowns. It's never been done before, and the guy doesn't have an MVP. And the guy wasn't even really considered for it this year. Let's talk about the word valuable real quick before we move on to other stuff pertaining to the Bills and other AFC teams from this past weekend. Let's talk about the word valuable for a second. We've done this exercise before, but it's never been more prominent than today. Because after watching yesterday, maybe that much more sick to know that I, I, I have to watch. I, I'm really starting to feel bad for Josh Allen, the guy. Sometimes I'm, I'm stuck in my own misery with this team that I, I forget the fact that the guy that's actually given me a reason to root for this team, or not, not root, I'll always root, believe me. I've been rooting through the depths of hell with this team. So I shouldn't say give me a reason to root, but give me a reason to have sincere hope that this team is finally the one that's going to have the best chance to do it in my lifetime. You, you rarely ever consider the fact that that guy's the one that's on the short end of the stick of everything. Taking the blame for a game where that game wouldn't even have been a two-score game if he's not in it. Taking the blame for a season where the guy had 50-plus touchdown. Let's talk about the word valuable. This team is 6-6. Six and six. Now, granted... Josh Allen played a fair share of it. You know, he, he, played, he played his hand in that. No question about it. That Jets lost week one. That's solely on the back of Josh Allen. 
We all know he had his moments in this season that definitely hurt the Bills more than it helped them. Had the Bills in position to win that game at the end of the Patriots game, Chiefs, uh, the Bills, uh, Bills defense gets walked on. Gave that team the lead against the Broncos, 12 men on the field. That's not Josh Allen. Gave that team the league in regu- lead in regulation. Gave that team the lead in overtime against the Philadelphia Eagles. That's not Josh Allen. Regardless, six and six, 0.1% chance to win the, or to, to, to get a top two seed, three game deficit in the AFC East to the Miami Dolphins. And not to mention a midseason firing at offensive coordinator. Not only is your back against the wall, not only are you sitting at 500, you lose your offensive coordinator and you lose structure, really. Not very often that good teams are canon offensive coordinators and coaches midseason and wind up making the most of it. You want to talk about making the most of it. They were a blown lead in overtime away from winning eight consecutive games after that offensive coordinator change. And Josh Allen had a whole hell of a lot to do with that. This team would not have sniffed the playoffs if if not for Josh Allen. They're six and six with him. Imagine what they would have been without him. And if you think for a second that they get a two seed in another AFC East title without him, or if he was playing shit ball, you're out of your mind. What's more valuable than a guy that leads the charge for a team that's sitting at six and six, brings him to 11 and six, overcomes legitimate statistics, 0.1% chance to be a top two seed. He goes and grabs that three game deficit to the, Dolphins, he goes and grabs that. Who's more valuable to their team in the league than Josh Allen? The answer, obviously, would probably be Patrick Mahomes because he's the most valuable guy in the league. He's the most valuable person to the league, not just his team. So in reality, all of what I'm saying here could probably be thrown away Because if you gave Patrick Mahomes the MVP every single year, would anybody really have a problem with it? But Josh Allen played better football than Patrick Mahomes did this entire regular season. And the truth of the matter, he played way better football than Lamar Jackson did too. Go look at the numbers. Josh Allen's numbers, far and away, better than Lamar Jackson's. Not just in the passing department, which you probably would have conceded. Better on the ground too. And in a one-game sample size, a microcosm of this whole argument, within one week, they play the exact same team on the exact same situation. Do or die, playoff game, at home. Josh Allen was the better quarterback by a country mile. So the reason I spent a little bit of time on that today is just because I felt it's worth talking about. I'll state it again. I have no problem with Lamar Jackson winning the MVP, one of my favorite players in the league. Congrats to him for winning it this year. It's not his fault that he was put in pen by everybody else. My question was why? I don't know. And it's funny with a lot of these, this, these situations we're being faced with, our, our, our question really is why, how? And we don't have the answer. There's plenty of people who love Josh Allen. Most people do love Josh Allen. In fact, if you don't love Josh Allen, do you love football? Do you love football? If you don't love Lamar Jackson, if you don't love Josh Allen, I mean, look, I can't stand Patrick Mahomes, because it's, but it's not because of the football player he is. because of how much he's ruined my life. He, he, he puts on display some of the greatest football I've ever seen. When it comes to the game of football, when I don't have a stake in the game, there's nobody in the world better to watch than, than Patrick Mahomes on a Sunday. I have all the respect in the world for him. What I'm saying is if you don't love these guys, you don't love football. Or, or maybe you, 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 like, you love like Iowa or Steelers football where you, you, you love 10 to 3 games that make you fall asleep. So I don't know what it is. I don't think he, he's got haters. That's for sure. All these guys do. But I don't quite understand why it, it, it went the way it did here. 
this year was awfully strange. You kept being told Josh Allen was basically bad for a large majority of this year. It's weird. And don't get me wrong. We came on here several times throughout the year. There were moments from Josh Allen that were brutal, terrible. But every one of these guys have had it. So the reason I bring this up today is I felt like yesterday uh, was a microcosm of the season it's in itself, really, where it just felt like Josh Allen was the more deserving player, the better player, and it was visible, yet for some reason, it's completely ignored. So, either way, nonetheless, and I'll just say this too, by the way, every time I bring this up, I haven't looked at the comments yet, but every time I... uh Bring this out, everybody. Somebody's always like, who cares about the MVP? It's about championships. Well, you know, we haven't had a championship, folks, so I wouldn't mind uh, celebrating one of the greatest athletes I've ever watched play the sport who happens to be on my team. I wouldn't mind celebrating him for a year where I feel like he deserves it. MVPs are something, folks. We talk about this all the time. We're talking about Josh Allen's legacy on the line. An MVP would go a long way for this guy. And I feel like he's deserved an MVP at, the, at this point. And I feel like this year could have been the year. I just feel like this year could have been the year. You know? It's crazy. Like, and then in the year where, where, where Aaron Rodgers won it for the second year in a row, like Allen would have won it in any other year. He would have won it in any other year if Rodgers didn't somehow have an unreal year and then proceed to just completely fall off a cliff after that. So I don't know. It's just the luck of the Bills, I guess. And Josh Allen, unfortunately, is thrown in the pit with the rest of us. So with that said, doesn't matter. Lamar loses, Josh Allen loses, and Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs move on and win. And uh, so do the San Francisco 49ers. I've been thinking about this just, just uh, once again. I've been thinking all day long. About those uh, those Detroit Lions, man. I mean, we we've had some real rough outs, real rough outs with these Bills the last handful of seasons, right? I mean, nobody's nobody's suffered more heartbreak in the history of of sports fandom than the Buffalo Bills fan base. I I, I firmly believe that. But during the, the, the at least my time here, the Bills have never gotten to a point in one of these games where they were the they were dominating an opponent the entire game and then blew it and lost. The way the, the Bills lose, it's always in the final moment in a back-and-forth game. Feels like that's what it's always been. It's what it always is. Because the Bills never get blown out. In fact, the Bills had seven losses this year. It's insane to think that they never lost by more than a touchdown the entire year. Not once. They may have been the only team in the league that had, that, that happened to this year. They didn't lose by a touchdown more than they didn't lose by a touchdown or more than a touchdown once. So they don't get blown out. They're usually the ones doing the blowing out. But when that's not happening, it's usually down to the wire. And as we know, in these big games, they've been coming down to the wire. And those are awful. Awful. But to think if the Bills had a 24 to 7 lead on the Chiefs last week, and they blew that in the span of eight minutes in the third quarter, imagine where you'd be sitting today. And imagine if that game wasn't the divisional game, but it was to go to the Super Bowl. I can't, I don't know how anybody in Detroit today gets up and does anything, but just sit in bed, stare at the ceiling, and just wait for them to, themselves to fall asleep again. I, I don't know how the hell you function today if you're a Detroit Lions fan. I, like I said, I've never felt more adjacently bad for a fan base than I do than I did yesterday and I do today for um for the Detroit Lions. I really thought they were gonna make it. Um Dan Campbell, that was a master class in how to lose a game, in in my opinion. And I know that's been a very hot button topic today. And I understand it got you there. I understand the aggressiveness is what Dan Campbell has built his career around. And I admire it. I do admire a guy who's willing to have the faith in his team and to do the things that other teams won't. It's gamble. It's been, you know, gamble after gamble this year, and it's paid off for the, the Lions. It got them all the way to here. 
But the difference is the analytics in the games that got you here, they were not games that have as much on the line as this one does. And when you have a 17-point lead at half, the Niners get the ball first, go down and score, and you have the ability to immediately match that score midway through the third quarter and maintain a three-score lead, I don't know how you pass that up. And if you watch the game, you know that the second the Lions did not convert that fourth down, the game was never the same. There was that dropped throw by Reynolds, I believe it was. It was either Reynolds or Williams for the Lions on that fourth and two. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not Dan Campbell's fault the guy dropped it, but I would never have gone for it in the first place because a drop is a risk that you take when you go for it on fourth down. So the easy answer was it's not Dan Campbell's fault, like I just said, because it isn't. That's the easy answer. It wasn't his fault that he dropped it, but it was his fault that they went for it. You can't have a drop if you don't go for it. And it felt to me in a game where you were the better team through the entirety of it, why not maintain a three-score lead? There's no need to continue to be the aggressor here because you're already up. And we all know that the Niners want to run the ball, and they're typically using clock to score. Now, but the, the, the thing of it is, that all changed because as soon as they went for that and didn't get it. Then Brock Purdy throw, throws the ball off of somebody's helmet. Brandon Ayuk makes the catch of the year. And next thing you know, eight minutes go by and you blew a 17-point lead. Next thing you know, you're up 24 to 7, and that turns to 34 to 24. Uh, I've never seen anything like it, really, in, in that type of situation. Um, so feel absolutely awful for the Lions. So they won't be making it to the Super Bowl, as we know. It will be the Niners, and of course, it will be these Kansas City Chiefs. Now, you might be wondering, what's the story? Let's go check it out via my good friends over at BetUS. Let's go check out the betting lines for the Super Bowl. I'm sure if you're like me, a lot of you guys like to bet on the Super Bowl, especially in a game like this one where you really don't have a rooting interest. You throw a couple of bucks, it helps find a team that you're going to be pulling for. Now, this is very interesting. If we look at BetUS right now and the current betting lines for the upcoming Super Bowl, the Kansas City Chiefs, once again, are a one-point underdog. That's, this is going to make three consecutive games for these Chiefs where they're an underdog. As I mentioned to you earlier, the Kansas City Chiefs under Patrick Mahomes, 10-1-1 against the spread as an underdog. Patrick Mahomes, 9-3 and three straight up, meaning he won those games as an underdog. Two of those nine wins coming in the last two weeks. I don't think this has ever happened before for these Chiefs, where they have been an underdog in three consecutive weeks. In fact, I would have argued they probably weren't an underdog in two consecutive weeks up until these last two. But the interesting thing is, the Kansas City Chiefs opened up as a two-and-a-half point underdog, and a lot of people said, I'm done getting burned by Mahomes, and they put money on the Chiefs. So it went from two-and-a-half, it's now down to one. So the Chiefs are just a one-point underdog this game is essentially a pick em. What Bet US and Vegas is telling you is, man, this game is going to be awfully close. It's going to be a coin flip type game, and that's probably what I expect. But I'll tell you this. When it comes down to a coin flip type game, who would I rather have on my side, Pat Mahomes or Brock Purdy? And then, of course, the over-under here is at 47 and a half. So if you're leaning Chiefs kind of like I am, you can go in and get on the action. Click on the link in the description below, sign up, deposit, and when you do deposit, you're going to get 125% sign-up bonus via that deposit, and then you can use that money to throw some coin on the Super Bowl. And you don't just have to bet on the Chiefs or the Niners. This is what I love about the Super Bowl. You can bet on the coin flip toss. You can bet on a gajillion different types of props. That's why the Super Bowl is always the Christmas of sports betting. So you can go take advantage of that over on BetUS. They, of course, have those props, parlays, the straight bets here, the teasers, a variety of other markets as well, including the NBA, the NHL, you name it, BetUS has it, including fast payouts, incredible customer service. They got it all including that 125% sign-up bonus and a link in the description below. One more quick word here from BetUS before we get to your Super Chats. Then we're going to start discussing the promotion of Joe Brady and some other coordinators around the league that are shopping around jobs that may be 
directly conflicting with the Buffalo Bills in coming up seasons here. We'll take a look at all of that as well. One quick word from BetUS before we do so. BetUS, America's favorite sports book, where you can bet on everything, anytime. Sportsbook, casino, horse racing, live betting, and more. We have the best bonuses in the industry. That's right, get a 125% sign-up bonus. And to celebrate our 30-year anniversary, we are giving up to 30 risk-free bets, a truck, Super Bowl tickets, and more. Don't miss out. Play smart. Join now. BetUS, where the game begins. All right, let's get to your super chats. Thanks for waiting on these, by the way, folks. Let's start from the top. My man Tyler Marshall coming in. Frazier is interviewing for the D.C. job with the Dolphins. Glad you brought me there, Tyler. We're going to be talking about that in just a second. Very interesting because he's not only uh, he's not the only candidate from the Buffalo Bills or prior to being with the Buffalo Bills, or prior being with the Buffalo Bills, that is interviewing for a defensive coordinator position with the Miami Dolphins. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Rich coming in. What a time to be alive, says Rich. Good to see you, bot. Good to see you, Rich. Thanks, as always, for hopping in, my brother. I appreciate it. Rich comes in again. He's saying, Bills, get a stud wide receiver in the draft and a healthy Milano in defense. We're in the Super Bowl next year. It's honestly not far-fetched. P.S. Campbell now worse than McDermott. Yeah, you ask anybody in the Detroit area, they're going to have uh, they're gonna have some words to say to you today about about Dan Campbell. You know what I don't get to about that whole situation is a lot of people today are saying, if I'm a Lions fan, I'm hanging, I'm, I'm holding my head up high. A lot to be proud of today. Such a loser's mentality, in my opinion. I mean, I understand you have to be like that, but how are you like that in the moment? At least be like me and give it a week after the Bills win and then start being the guy who starts to look for the silver linings, right? Like we kind of did tonight. How in the moment can you be like, eh, head up high? I understand if you went out, look it, don't get me wrong. If the, if the lions went out yesterday and lost 48 to 10, then that's when you say, Hey man, these lions were 0 16. How many years ago? And here we are in the NFC championship. What a great year. A lot to be proud of. I'm sorry. I don't have anything to be proud of today. I got nothing to hold my head up high on today. When I'm up 24 to seven at halftime and my head coach rolls the dice on two unnecessary fourth downs and my rookie running back fumbles the ball on the first snap of a series inside my own red zone. Sorry, not holding my head up high today. Not holding my head up high today. Nothing you can say and make me feel better about that one. I do not understand that mentality today. A lot to be proud of. Hang your head up high. Uh, no thanks. I mean, even Dan Campbell told you himself that you know how hard it is to get back here. He knows it. He knows it. that guy's not going to sleep for two months. And if I were a Lions fan, I wouldn't either. Uh, that's about as bad of a, a loss as you can possibly suffer. See Jello one coming in here saying, I'm convinced it's because people were so critical of Allen coming out of college and analysts are too prideful to admit they were wrong about him. But you know what's weird about that is that that was the same sentiment surrounding Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson was the last pick of the first round. Even, even the Baltimore Ravens passed on him once in the first round before they drafted him. Go back and watch a couple of the sound bites when Lamar Jackson was drafted, and you're going to hear a lot of criticism. So there's part of me that does agree with you, but that doesn't, that's not the case for Lamar Jackson. And it's a very, very, very similar situation. Now, maybe it's because Lamar Jackson played at a much bigger school in Louisville and, and Josh Allen was slinging the ball at, at Wyoming. Maybe that's got something to do with it. And I definitely think that Josh Allen had the much um, lower floor but we all knew what the ceiling was, and that's what the Bills wound up taking the gamble on. And, and as we know, Josh Allen did defy math itself these last handful of years with the Buffalo Bills. So I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is. Um, what it could potentially be is that Lamar very quickly became an instant success. Josh Allen was an instant highlight reel, but it wasn't instant success. The Ravens were built earlier to be better than the Bills early, early in the career of Lamar Jackson and Josh Allen. But you look at the success and, and the Bills have been the better team. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. I, I just can't help but think it's personal bias. Because like I said, you either love all these guys or you just hate football. Like if you, if you love Allen, how do you not love Lamar Jackson. If you love Lamar Jackson, how do you not love Allen? Vice versa. How, how? You just don't love the sport. You don't love the current iteration of the quarterback if you don't love these guys. 
And as I say, as I've said a million times tonight, I have no problem with Lamar winning the MVP. I think he is certainly an MVP caliber quarterback. My biggest problems is one of two things. One, why was it etched in stone when it shouldn't have been? There was no legitimate reason for Lamar Jackson to have been guaranteed the MVP a month before the votes when he had no reason to, to be granted that, that right. And two, why is Josh Allen the only one of these three most valuable players in the league to not have a most valuable player recognition under his belt? Those are my problems. All right, let's talk about some hirings that have been done and some hirings that can potentially be around the corner. Some very interesting stuff happening in Buffalo, as well as around the AFC, including in our own division, as my man Tyler Marshall alluded to just a few minutes ago with his super chat talking about Leslie Frazier interviewing with the Dolphins for defensive coordinator. We can start there. We'll start there with the teams that are looking or hiring guys that used to be with the Buffalo Bills or are currently with the Buffalo Bills. Let's start there with the Miami Dolphins. They were uh, reported today to be interviewing Leslie Frazier for their defensive coordinator position this coming up season. As we know, the Miami Dolphins just parted ways with Vic Fangio, who immediately took a job in Philadelphia. I'm not entirely sure if it was Miami that moved on from Vic Fangio. I feel like it was more of Vic Fangio wanting to move on from Miami. It felt like but either way he left and immediately took another job that left that job vacant. The Miami Dolphins have now inquired on two Buffalo bills personnel or former personnel, Leslie Frazier being one of them. And let's talk about Leslie Frazier real quick for a second. Leslie Frazier was a phenomenal defensive coordinator for these Buffalo Bills. He was phenomenal. The majority of the 13 seconds got put on his shoulders. He took the brunt of the blame. And I think we've learned since his departure that that was not fair. That was not fair. It was not right. We don't know what ended up happening in that locker room that, that led to a very weird departure for Leslie Frazier. I'm not sure we'll ever know. But I will say that when Leslie Frazier was interviewed about the article from Tyler Dunn that came out about Sean McDermott, Leslie Frazier was interviewed and he seemed to have nothing but good things to say about Sean McDermott in that interview. So, you know, how much of that is being PC when, when, when you're in front of the public eye, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, Leslie Frazier was a phenomenal defensive coordinator for these bills. It, it wound up ending in a very odd way, but, when you're the lead of the defense like Sean McDermott has been and was this past season, I guess at times when you got two alphas in there trying to have it their way, things don't necessarily end up uh, going the right way. We saw it happen with Frazier. We saw it happen with Brian Dable there. So we also just saw it with Ken Dorsey. So uh, the ending makes it seem like it was a lot worse, I think, than, than the reflection of what his time was in, in Buffalo. Leslie Frazier was great for these bills. And that Miami Dolphins defense, when they're healthy, they can be scary if they are coached right and if they are uh, maximized. So we'll see if Leslie Frazier goes in there and takes that job. If he does, that will be a very interesting development. The Bills-Dolphins uh, rivalry has never been more hot. Now, I love the, the term rivalry being used in here because typically a rivalry would result in wins from the other side. However... That hasn't been much of the case for these Miami Dolphins. Eleven and three against these Bills with Josh Allen, I believe. Twelve and three, something like that. I forget. You know, when you when, when, when you're winning so much, it's like the Chiefs. We're like, we're like the the Chiefs to us is like what we are to the Dolphins. So um, at least we know what it feels like on the other side. But you can, in, when I say rivalry, you do feel the animosity from the fan base, from one another, back and forth. You feel the tension between the teams when they play. I mean, this is as prominent as this rivalry within the division has been since the Marino and uh, and Jim Kelly days. So it would add another wrinkle to this ever-growing rivalry if the Bills' former defensive coordinator, who has a strange exit with the Bills, ends up taking over as coordinator for the Bills, or one of the Bills' biggest arch rivals, uh, in the Miami Dolphins, who they would have to face, of course, at least twice a year, potentially three times like they did last season. So interesting development there. But Leslie Frazier, not the only candidate being looked into by the Miami Dolphins, who was or currently on the Buffalo staff. The Miami Dolphins are also looking into Bobby Babich. 
who is the Bills linebacker coach. And that would be a tough loss for these Buffalo Bills if they were to lose Coach Bobby Babbage because we know what he has done with this linebacking core. How great has he been for these Bills? They turned a Buffalo Bills team this season, you know, in conjunction with Sean McDermott, they took this defense that was off the charts banged up and they allowed them to maintain one of the best defenses in this league throughout the year, despite the interchanging parts on a weekly basis. And when you lose Matt Milano, the best player on your defense, who just so happens to also be a linebacker, that throws you in the biggest rut of them all. Well, look at what these, you know, a few of these guys have done, what they've come on to do that you weren't really expecting much. I mean, Terrell Bernard's the biggest example. Hell, Terrell Bernard has become so great for these Buffalo Bills that we've we've argued this past week that if even he was able to go against the Chiefs last week, the Bills might have had a different outcome. No one's saying that six months ago. No one's even thinking of that. Terrell Bernard goes from a guy that no one knows to, oh my God, this guy's one of the best players on this entire team. And we were saying with with the utmost certainty that when Milano and him were healthy to start the year, I know it feels like a lifetime ago, but you probably remember when the year started with Bernard and Milano, they were on pace to be far and away the best linebacking core in this league, the best linebacking tandem. They were off to an insane start, forcing turnovers left and right. The the uh, the quarterback rating they were allowed when targeting or what allowed when they allowed when targets came their way was next to zero. So. You know, Bobby Babbage has had his hand in that. Tyrell Dotson's come on, you know, Balen Specter as well. Guys you're not really expecting a whole crazy amount from have really come on to be either insane studs for Terrell Bernard or decent to really good pieces for these Buffalo Bills um, in, in positions where you're going to need them like they did this year when Matt Milano went out. So that would be a significant loss. You'd hate to see him go, but when he's coached as well as he has, it's inevitable you wind up going and taking a, a promotion here. But it may is it may very well come against uh it may very well come at these Buffalo Bills expense more than just losing him because he could go to the Dolphins as Leslie Frazier could. They could have to face him in this rivalry twice a year as well. So it's looking like the Dolphins are narrowing in on a on a hiring soon here, and it very well could come down to two Buffalo Bills defensive uh coaches that could fill that role. So that's a very interesting development. And I wonder if by the week's end here, we wind up figuring out which one of those guys, the Miami dolphins end up going with, if one of those two guys at all, but it's not just the defensive side of things that have been shopped around for these Buffalo bills. Ken Dorsey. Remember that guy fired by the Buffalo Bills midseason after that 6 and 6 start. Well, he didn't have to wait long to get another crack as an offensive coordinator in this league and he's staying on Lake Erie. He only has to drive about two and a half hours down the road to take over another offense with the Cleveland Browns. Just yesterday Ken Dorsey was named the offensive coordinator of the Cleveland Browns and will be taking over this upcoming season. How interesting is that? So Ken Dorsey, who was promoted from the quarterback coach position to the offensive coordinator position for these Buffalo Bills just a season ago, he lasted one and a half years with the Bills before getting fired, immediately gets hired by a Cleveland Browns offense that is going to have their work cut out for Ken Dorsey. Because not only is he going to have to get this offense in position to continuously make the playoffs here like the Browns have been on the cusp of or doing the last couple of seasons, but he's going to be tasked with essentially saving uh, Deshaun Watts' career. He's also going to be tasked with not making the Cleveland Browns look like they made one of the worst offseason moves in the history of professional sports. As it stands right now, the limited amount of games Deshaun Watson has played with these Cleveland Browns, he has a 41.9 quarterback rating. That's damn near the worst in the league amongst the time he has started. So not only does Ken Dorsey have to come in here and have this whole offense clicking on all cylinders, but he's going to have to do it with a quarterback that essentially pulled off the greatest heist maybe in the history of, of time on these Cleveland Browns. I don't know what I I don't even want to know, or I do want to know. I mean, what the hell do I care? But I I don't know what we're going to look back on with, with this situation and be saying. The way it's going right now, 
I have no reason to believe we're not going to be looking back at the Browns acquisition of Deshaun Watson and saying that was one of, if not the worst offseason acquisitions in the history of not only the NFL, but of sports for a variety of reasons, not only because they gave him damn near a half a billion dollars guaranteed. It never had happened in the history of the NFL, but they did so while he was in the middle of one of the most talked about headline-making scandals that the NFL has had in a while from an individual player. They not only gave him the most guaranteed money in the history of the league, they did it while he was facing criminal accusations from how many women? I don't even remember. It was, it was an absurd amount. So the way it's looking right now, based on not only those factors, but the fact that now once he comes onto the team, he's been damned near terrible. And when he's not terrible, he's been completely injured and unavailable. I don't know how we don't look back and say, wow, this was, uh, this was all time bad. And now here comes Ken Dorsey, who struggled enough with what we all consider to be one of the best quarterbacks in this league to where he got fired. Not only is he going to have to keep this, this uh, Browns offense in playoff type form, he's going to be tasked with getting the most out of Deshaun Watson to not only try and save his career, but save the asses of the Cleveland Browns top, uh, top office who went and made this, this move. So not an easy task for Ken Dorsey, but Hey, congratulations to him for, uh, you know, pick getting back up on his feet. At the end of the day, this, th these are humans that have families and, and they're looking for jobs. They need jobs. And Hey, Ken Dorsey didn't have to wait long. He got the gig. It's going to be a tough one, but congratulations to Ken Dorsey, former Buffalo bills, offensive coordinator for getting another job. The Buffalo bills do not face Ken Dorsey and the Cleveland Browns this year. So they won't have to go up against them unless they see him in the playoffs. But if he hangs on to that position, maybe they see him in the coming years here. Uh, but that is at least three plus, three coaches right now that have either taken a job or are looking to take a job with one of the Bills' inner conference opponents. So that just happened all over the course of the last couple of days here, including the Bills retaining Joe Brady and promoting him to offensive coordinator. So let's talk about that. Joe Brady who was, of course, named the offensive coordinator for these Buffalo Bills when Ken Dorsey was fired, has now been named the full-time offensive coordinator of these Buffalo Bills. He has been promoted from interim to official full-time offensive coordinator. I think that this shocks nobody. Maybe you thought the Bills would go out, take a bit of a deeper look, than they originally had here. Try to find maybe something else, but I think the writing was pretty much on the wall. I think everybody knew that Joe Brady was at least going to get one more year, one more crack at being the offensive coordinator at what he, you know, after what he had just accomplished. So let's talk about it. We talked about it a little bit yesterday on the live stream during the AFC Championship game, but for those who aren't around, I weren't around. I'll, I'll reiterate what I I had said a bit. Um, there's two ways to look at it. I had brought this up yesterday uh, a couple of years ago, going into the 2022 season, which was of uh, which was Ken Dorsey's first year as the OC. Rico and I had spoke with. Devin Singletary and Matt Barkley. And we didn't really know a whole hell of a lot about Ken Dorsey. So we were trying to get to know him through those guys. And they were telling us that, you know, he's not what meets the eye. He is a spitfire, passionate dude who is into it more than you could imagine. And little did we know that we would realize that awfully quickly. I mean, we saw how passionate and, you know, dedicated to the craft Ken Dorsey was. It didn't pan out well for him, but you can't say he didn't. You know, he wasn't uh, he wasn't in. He didn't care. We we have the video footage of him in the booth to prove it. And we all know at that time, you know, it felt like those dudes were were advocating for him. Uh, Devin Singletary and Matt Barkley. But as we know, Josh Allen gave him the biggest vote of confidence. He was Josh Allen's quarterback coach. And it felt like the familiarity was going to benefit these bills because you're moving on from Brian Dable, who was one of the best coordinators in the NFL. So good, in fact, that he goes and gets a full time head coaching job with the New York Giants. And that's big shoes to fill. 
because Josh Allen had had the same offensive coordinator since his rookie year. And you go from a guy who many people had questions about to, holy shit, this guy's one of the best players in the league. And a lot of people were giving, in my opinion, way too much credit to Brian Dable for that being the case. It, it, good, happily enough, if that's a, the right way to put it, uh, at least for me, the narrative has gone away a bit because Josh Allen, without him this year and last year, had, once again, two consecutive seasons with 40-plus touchdowns. So might not have been all Brian Dable. But if you remember, when Brian Dable left, a lot of people were saying, you know, Brian Dable made Josh Allen. Josh Allen is who he is because of Brian Dable. That never sat right with me. Josh Allen was certainly benefited by Brian Dable. There's no question about it. Many, many would, many would be, you know, many quarterbacks would be when you have as great of an offensive coordinator as Brian Dable was and is. But the people that were saying that he made him, that he was what he was because of him, you know, I, I, I don't know about all that. So, um, you move on from Brian Dable and you're thinking, well, Josh Allen's given vote of confidence to Ken Dorsey. And maybe this makes the most sense because Ken Dorsey's already in the building. And if we have to move on from one of these great offensive coordinators, then maybe it's best to do so with a guy that Josh Allen's already familiar with. He's already around. He already knows the offense and we can just promote him from within and move on. And, you know, at first it seemed like that was going to be what, what made the most sense and, and, and what was going to be the best solution for this team moving forward at the, at the coordinator position. And it didn't wind up working out this situation. It, it's a bit similar, but it's also drastically different at the same time. Brian Dable wasn't fired in the middle of the season. Brian Dable wasn't fired at all. In fact, Brian Dable leaves on his own terms because he goes and takes the most coveted position in the sport. And that is being a head coach. This situation, although same in the fact that, Josh Allen is advocating for Joe Brady being promoted. He was, of course, already in the building. Different, obviously, because he's taking over after he took over in the middle of the season, after a firing in the middle of the season. So it's tough to directly compare it, but it is interesting that this is now two consecutive full-time hirings at the offensive coordinator spot for these bills that have been promoted directly from within. He 100% earned this full-time job, though. I don't really know how you would be able to argue against that. Let's talk about how Joe Brady earned this gig. Ken Dorsey gets fired 6-6 six and six at the time. Joe Brady, here's the keys. Can you drive this borderline totaled car to the finish line? And along the way, somehow... When Joe Brady took over those keys, grabbed them, started up the car, and got moving, that car not only made it to the finish line, but somehow it went from being like it looked like it was in a wreck to looking like one of the best cars on the road. He goes 7-2 and two in his nine games as the Buffalo Bills interim offensive coordinator. A six-game win streak. And if it weren't for a 60-yard field goal by the Philadelphia Eagles and a blown lead in overtime, the Bills had the lead in overtime that game, it would have been an eight-game win streak. Seven and two in nine games. The two losses, one, that overtime game against the Eagles in overtime. So by a very narrow margin. And a three-point loss to the Kansas City Chiefs as we see now, the team that nobody can beat when it matters most. A three-point loss to those Chiefs, but they were in a position to win the game and certainly tie it, despite coming up on the short end of the stick. We got a nine-game sample size with Joe Brady, and all he did was win six consecutive games, and two of the, the losses he suffered were by the skin of your teeth. You cannot possibly imagine a more difficult audition than what Ken or that you cannot possibly imagine a more difficult audition than what Joe Brady just went through these last couple of months. And to be able to accomplish what he did being placed in that top of a spot was extraordinarily impressive 
and is 100% the reason why he deserved to be promoted to full-time offensive coordinator for this team. They were backed into a corner more so than they've really ever been under Sean McDermott and with Josh Allen. And whether it was because of him or not, how can you not give him a hefty dose of credit for it? You can't tell me it wasn't a lot to do with him offensively. The interesting thing is there are, there's arguments against that. And it comes down to the numbers. Because the numbers under Ken Dorsey were not drastically different than the numbers under Joe Brady. Joe Brady's offense was uh, averaging 27.1 points per game. Ken Dorsey's was averaging 26.7. So we're talking a fraction of a number different in points per game. And Joe Brady's offense was actually averaging 0.7 yards per play less than Ken Dorsey's. 5.1 yards per play for Joe Brady. 5.8 for Ken Dorsey. But I've been on record saying this throughout the time in which he took over, it took over and I still feel the same way today. The biggest difference was his ability to stick to his guns, stick to what was working, be able to adapt and above anything else be able to implement common sense when really it just felt like all was needed was common sense. It felt like with Ken Dorsey at times, common sense was not so common. It felt like they were doing things just for the sake of doing them, even though they weren't necessarily putting them in the best position to win. They were not establishing the run game nearly as well as they could have. They were not allowing Josh Allen to unleash his full potential. They were not allowing Josh Allen to run for whatever reason. Maybe that had to do with it being earlier in the season, I'm not entirely sure. But at the end of the day, we all know that this team is not nearly as good when they are hindering Josh Allen's, one of Josh Allen's best capabilities, and that's his legs. It felt like when Ken Dorsey came in, or excuse me, when Ken Dorsey left and Joe Brady came in, that there was a level of calmness that came over this team that was not there with Ken Dorsey, and you felt it. You saw Josh Allen finally seem like a happy player again. It seemed like Sean McDermott, in conjunction with that article that came out uh, from Tyler Dunn, he seemed like a weight had come off of his shoulders. He seemed to be coaching much more uh, fluidly, loosely, if you will. It felt like he brought the solution that they needed, and it wasn't necessarily coming in and throwing uh, a whole new playbook at him and, and rewriting or, or recreating the wheel. In fact, it was the opposite. He did a lot of what they were already doing, but he ended up going more towards the things that were working the best. And that is what I think really propelled these bills to win as many games as they did down the stretch and accomplish what seemed like, you know, an impossibility when Ken Dorsey was fired. The biggest example to me, and I mentioned this yesterday, the biggest example to me was that Dallas Cowboys game. The Bills didn't go into that game at home against the Dallas Cowboys thinking we're going to run the ball 50 times today no matter what. We're just going to do that. We think that's the that we think that's what's going to work today. We think that's what's best against this team and therefore we're going to do it. They went in there like I imagine they do any other game with their game plan, but early on they noticed that they were running the ball with exceptional success. And instead of saying, hey, we're, we're having a whole lot of success on the ground here, but we still got to get our superstar quarterback involved. Joe Brady said, the hell with that. We're running the ball until they can prove that they can stop it. And they never proved they can stop it. And what wound up, what wound up happening? One of the Bills' most dominant victories of the entire year. And Josh Allen barely had to lift a fingernail the entire game. And that had to do almost entirely with Joe Brady's decision-making where Joe Brady sits back and says, we're running the ball. They can't stop it. Why the hell would we go away from it? Bills won that game 31 to 10. And I think let's, let's go back and look at Josh Allen's numbers in that game. J Josh Allen had 94 yards in that game. James Cook had 179. Josh Allen was 7 of 15 in that game for 94 yards. 
There's some teams out there that just say, hey, we have a quarterback. We're paying him all this money. He's all he's great. He's this. He's that. We had a game plan. We're going with it. Joe Brady said, we're, this, why, why would I do that when it's raining sideways and this team can't stop the run if they were given $10 billion to do it? So that to me was one of the best examples of his ability to just do what is necessary. And not only that, but he also unleashed Josh Allen. It felt like Josh Allen was handcuffed early on in the year. And I go back to the first game they played post Ken Dorsey firing. It was against the Jets. And I remember uh, Joe Brady saying when he talked to Josh Allen about what, what he wanted to see in that game, he said, just go be Josh Allen. And if you remember back in that game, it was the first time we had seen Josh Allen truly crack a genuine smile in like weeks. That means something, I think. And it meant something to this team, clearly, because they wouldn't lose another game until last week. They win that Jets game. They would lose the Eagles game. They wouldn't lose another game again until last week. The biggest difference was the implementation of common sense. And also the implementation of establishing a different identity that these Buffalo Bills have not established with Josh Allen. And that is the ability to run the ball. These Buffalo Bills could not sustain a solid run game since Josh Allen has come into this league up until this season. Joe Brady came in and ran the ball. 51% of the time, I believe. Let me go back and double check that. Yeah. Jo Ken Dorsey ran the ball with these Buffalo Bills 41% of the time. A 10% increase on the ground. And what did you wind up seeing as a result from that? Not only was the run game working, James Cook a phenomenal year, over 1,000 yards. Josh Allen started getting well involved in that run game. Go look at Josh Allen's rushing numbers towards the end of the year. They just kept increasing and increasing. The amount of times he ran, the amount of rush yards he had, all were increasing. Not only was it working, not only were they scoring that way, not only were they winning games that way, but they were winning the time of possession against every team they faced, essentially. I mean, they were dominating in that category. And I think that that went a long way towards allowing this team to show different shades of what they've been. We have come accustomed to watching this Bills team just move up and down the field in a handful of plays, just nuke the ball down the field and go score. They showed a different brand of football this year, and I think it's one that's more sustainable than that of Josh Allen throwing the ball all over the field. I think he implemented a lot more of underneath type throws for Josh Allen, a lot more high percentage pass plays for Josh Allen. And when you combined that with the success on the run that they continued to go to, I thought it was an awfully impressive uh, ideology to bring to this team at a moment of pure despair when they fired Ken Dorsey. Now, here's the real exciting aspect of it. When he takes over, you got a game in, in five, six days, and you're never going to have time to completely rip the playbook up and, and, and get starting brand new in the middle of the season. There's no chance you're going to be able to do that. The exciting thing is I think we already got a lot of great things from Joe Brady throughout this year here, and that was not including any additional, or I, I shouldn't say any additional. I'm sure he added a handful of things here and there, but that's really without any major additional uh, ideology or, or scheme implementation that he may be able to bring to this team with a full offseason under, uh, under his belt. So I think the best is yet to come for Joe Brady, and that's saying something because he just had an unbelievable audition for this gig. I don't know how the Bills could have went out and looked at anybody else and felt like they were going to be able to, to, to top Joe Brady in an interview after Joe Brady has just been interviewing, interviewing for this job for two full months and was essentially nails the entire time. So... Congratulations to Joe Brady. I think it's well-deserved, and I'm very excited to see what the plan is moving forward and what he is able to continue to bring to this team that we have yet to see from him.
One more thing before we close up shop tonight. The Bills have been looking around for a defensive coordinator. Interesting because Sean McDermott was the defensive coordinator this past season when Leslie Frazier departed. Sean McDermott took over as the defensive coordinator and an unbelievable job that he did. But with a with a year um, gone by here without Leslie Frazier, the Bills are looking to add some more help in that department, take a bit off uh, the shoulders, I'm assuming, of Sean McDermott. I'm sure he'll still continue to call the plays, but it can't hurt to have a defensive coordinator in the building with you to handle the defensive side of things when head coach stuff is also needing to be handled. So the bills are shopping around for defensive coordinators and they are uh, in the process of looking into interviewing Mike Caldwell, who was the Jacksonville Jaguars defensive coordinator. They're also looking into interviewing Sean Desai, who was just the coordinator defensive coordinator for the Philadelphia Eagles. Now what's interesting about this is that Sean Desai lasted one season with the Philadelphia Eagles and their defense was abysmal this past year. The Philadelphia Eagles had the worst pass defense in the entire league. And you really saw that on display as the year went on. I mean, they were awful towards the end of the year. I don't know if there was a worse pass defense in the league, not only on the, on the paper, but on the eyes than the Philadelphia Eagles. And he gets canned within a year. He takes over the job in February. He's canned last week, but that is a player. The bills are, or excuse me, a coach. The bills are looking into to fill in for the defensive coordinator job. Now you can't, you know, just because it was bad there doesn't mean it'll be bad here. I mean, as we know, th- th- this happens all the time. And Steve Spagnola was a god awful head coach. I think he, I think he has like a one to three win loss ratio as a head coach, or one to four win loss ratio as a head coach. He's probably going to be a Hall of Famer when it comes to a defensive coordinator. So, it's interesting how things are different with, with what team you're with, what role you're in, right? Uh, so, who's to say it wouldn't be successful? But just thought that was an interesting note because that was not a good defense that Philadelphia put out on display this year. And then Mike Caldwell, he was with the Jacksonville Jaguars for the last two seasons, I believe. He also has history dating well back into the early 2000s with Sean McDermott when they both spent time on the Philadelphia Eagles staff. So he is another guy that the Buffalo Bills are looking into right now as well. So we'll keep an eye on it throughout the week, see if the Buffalo Bills end up firing, uh, excuse me, hiring rather, a uh, defensive coordinator this week. They already locked up the offensive coordinator position, but maybe by the uh, the time I join you next, the Bills could have a defensive coordinator and the Miami Dolphins could have a defensive coordinator that comes from within the Buffalo organization as well. So that'll be interesting, Uh, but we'll keep an eye on that and we'll talk more about that on the next episode of the Smoke Break. But for now, I really appreciate you joining me tonight on a Monday near two hours in the books. Appreciate you joining me yesterday if you did hop in for the live streams during the game. Much love. I had a ton of fun doing that. Before we close up, two more Super Chats I'm just noticing before we hop out. Rich coming in with another one saying, we talk about loser mentality, but there's still plenty of Bills fans just still happy being in a drought and over. Let's stop the mentality and think Super Bowl. I think the majority of uh, us are, I believe. I think we've moved on from the people happy about the drought being over, but I think that there are still people lingering around that are just happy being in the conversation, but that's going to be like that with any fan base. I just felt like today the general sentiment around the Lions was like, hold your head up high, a lot to be proud of, and I just don't know how you can feel that way after you were the better team yesterday and lost. If you went out and proved that you really didn't belong there, or, you know, I shouldn't say that, you went out and proved you can make it there, but you just weren't good enough, then I'd say, hey, you made it this far and you're only going to get better, sky's the limit. But when you were the better team on the field and you had a 91% chance to win that football game at halftime and you lose, I I just don't know how the mentality can be all smiles and positivity today. And then one more from Rich before we close up. Dorsey and Watson celebrating happy endings for sure. We'll see how that goes. Look, I'm interested to see how Ken Dorsey handles Deshaun Watson. That's going to be a tough job. Not only do you have to get that offense in form and and match what their defense is capable of doing for that Browns team, but you're going to have to be tasked with really getting the most out of a Deshaun Watson that not only ransacked the bank of the Cleveland Browns, but has been bad when he's available and he's not available often. So work cut out for Ken Dorsey, no question. We'll be back for another one this week. We'll do some sort of Super Bowl preview. We'll look into some bets and some fun stuff like that. We'll talk about the Super Bowl coming up, and we'll also have much more content coming your way um, this week as well from not only me, but 
uh, Rico and all the boys. But you'll find me again some point this week. Keep it locked on my Twitter at Zbot Tweets for updates on shows as well as here on the channel. Subscribe and hit the bell, and you'll know the next time I'm live will we'll be within the next couple of days where we'll talk about whatever happens to come up. The way things have been going recently, we'll have plenty to talk about before the draft. So that's always seemingly the case. In the new wave of the NFL, it's a 12-month it's a 12-month uh, sport these days. So, until then, we'll talk about whatever, whatever's uh, whatever's next. But until then, I appreciate you coming and talking about what was at hand tonight. Much love, really appreciate you stopping by, and we'll see you on the next one, folks. But until then, enjoy the rest of your night, enjoy the rest of your week. I'll see you on the next episode of the Smoke Break. As always, go Bills.